This week, we read the Parsha of Vayakel, and we also read a special section of Shkolim, because this Shabbat is called Shabbat Shkolim, coming out right before Rosh Chodesh Ador, and this is Ador number two, which means the Rosh Chodesh that falls before Purim, and we have a custom to read Shkolim at that point, which we just really read last week, but we're going to read it again. The title of this class is going, is actualizing the Mishkan. And I want to take a moment just to go through the concept of what every artist goes through. To create a work of art, a person has a vision or an idea or an image in mind. In still life, a person could even have a bowl of fruit in front of them. A person looks at the image in their imagination and then attempts in some medium or other to create that image in reality. It could be a vision that's expressed in music. It could be an image expressed in painting, in constructing something. So this is what we're up to in terms of the history of the Jewish people. The Jewish people have been commanded to create a house of Hashem. And God has transmitted to Moshe images, ideas, concepts, items, furnishings, coverings, architectural plans, everything in concept. And now the Jewish people assemble together for the task of actually translating this concept and this vision and these plans into reality. And that's something if we think about is a, is a big challenge for people. You know, how often do we hear people say, I love someone and I don't know how to express that, or I don't know how to convey that feeling and to make it real. That's what we're going to explore tonight. And we're going to explore it by taking a quick breathtaking look throughout the Torah. But let me first give you a quick summary of Vayakel, which consists of 122 sentences in the Torah. And Vayakel begins with a mention of the Shabbat, which teaches us that a, that the, what we define as malacha, creative activity on Shabbat, comes from the building of the Mishkan and what, was, what took place there. It also teaches us that we can't violate Shabbat to build a Mishkan. So even something as exciting, as eternal, as spiritual as building a house of Hashem doesn't push aside our obligation to have a day of rest. And we're going to relate the idea of Shabbat in a moment to this concept of actualizing something. Because we have a Kabbalistic statement that we sing every Friday night, was included in the Luchad Dadi, that Shabbat was sof ma'aseh b'machashava t'chira. An interesting insight into Shabbos, that God first conceived of Shabbos but it wasn't created, it doesn't come, it doesn't find a place in reality until after all of the creation is finished. An interesting irony and something which we're gonna see gives us a lot of insight into what it means to have a concept and to have something emerge from that concept that is real and tangible. The Torah goes on to Moshe invites the contributions and unlike any experience that um, anyone knows, the people contributed too much and they had to be told to stop. And then the construction of the actual Mishkan, all of the furnishings, the first the structure itself and the furnishings and all the details was undertaken. But Salel was charged with making the Ark itself. They make the two altars, they make the incense table, they make everything that has to go into the Mishkan, into this house of God, the curtains, the cover that goes over it, 
the planks and their compartments, the partitions, the screen, all these things are actually translated and transformed from a vision and a concept into something that could be touched and felt in occupied space. And that's how this Parsha goes through. They make the, the two altars, they make the labor, they do everything that has to be done. And finally they, they create the screen and they complete that. And an interesting note that we found on page 529 in the art scroll where they express the Masoretic, the meaning of the Masoretic notes, the 122 verses in this cetera correspond to a Hebrew word snu'a, which is similar to the word sne. And in other words, just as at the beginning of the process of Exodus, at the beginning of the book of Exodus, God made God's presence manifest in the burning bush. So the bush was there and then it, God inhabited it, so to speak. So now we have the equivalent of that bush fabricated in the world, <clears throat> which is the makings of the Mishkan has to be put together. All the pieces have to fit, not an easy thing to accomplish. And then it's ready for God to inhabit it as God will at the very end of the book of Shemot and in more detail in the third book of the Torah in the book of Leviticus. So that's the overview of what we're going to encounter. Now there's a word that appears over and over and over again. And we're going to start taking a look at it at the beginning of this Parsha. And you're going to see the word. I was going to count the words. I didn't have a chance to do that. You turn to page 516, 517. It begins in sentence 10, a few sentences in. And it reads as follows. Every wise-hearted person among you shall come and make everything. Vayasu. At We're actually going to make them. They are going to become a thing, an object, no longer just a concept or a thought. And if you turn over the page and you look here, I have it written down and go into chapter 36 on page 520, 521. Practically every sentence that begins. Bitsal shall carry out with love and every wise-hearted man with whom Hashem has endowed wisdom and insight to know and to do the word asa. If you asa bitsal, I'll be all above. They're going to make it. And they're going to make this and they're going to make that. Go down to send and say, Biasu kochacham lev. And all the wise-hearted people are going to make. And we have the word make repeated at least at the beginning of sentence eight, the beginning of sentence 14. Vayas yuriotizim, if you turn over the page. And they may he made the curtains. Sentence 20, Vayat et Vayas es hakroshim, and they made the planks. And sentence 33, over and over and over again, that they're making things, and they're making things, and they're making things. So, and this is an exciting time. If you think about it, you know, you could imagine as an analogy or an allegory, a tortured artist who's sitting and thinking and conceiving, or even think about an architect who stands on a piece of ground and just envisions what a home, what an inviting home will be, where it should be placed, how tall it should be, what its dimensions should be, how big much of the site it should occupy, what gives it the right symmetry and, and everything else that goes into it. And those are moments of thought and contemplation, exploration, looking at variable things. And then the person, decides on a plan and even then the work is far from completed because in actualizing the plan we have to make a lot of compromises in terms of what things actually look like and for all of us who are not great artists and who know you know, you come to class as a little child and the teacher tells you that uh that the jewish people built a mishkan and gives you a crayon that says draw a mishkan draw a picture of anything, and the proportions are off, the design is off, and even when the child looks at it, they're filled with disappointment. And I just want to say parenthetically that that's the importance of teaching art as part of a program, because it's the, 
experience of realizing that to create, to bring something to fruition is a daunting process. And it's a disappointing process because perfection eludes, ultimately it eludes all of us. Now it doesn't elude Hashem, but that's what's so interesting about this. Because God details every specification for this house of God. <clears throat> we would have been better off if God would have built it. It would have been perfect. It could have been exactly right. And indeed, and in fact, there's a Kabbalistic concept that the third temple, the ultimate eternal temple, won't be built, but it'll descend from heaven already constructed and land on the temple mount. And hence it will be eternal because it's not the product of the efforts of individual people. So we get this idea of making something, creating something. Now, importantly, I want to go and look at this a little bit more closely. And if anyone has a question, please unmute yourself, ask your question. I would really appreciate the chance to discuss these ideas in greater detail. Well, let's take a quick look through the Torah. If you have an, an art scroll stone Chumash in front of you, and if you turn to page nine, you find one of my favorite sentences in the entire Torah. And the sentence reads as follows. It's Genesis chapter one, sentence 31. Vayar Elohim et kol asher osah. And God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. And that, of course, ushers in the Shabbat. As we mentioned before, now that God saw, I've, cre I've completed creation. Everything is there. And now that could be the end of the sixth day. And on the seventh day, to complete this, God introduces Shabbat into the world, into the universe. But God, that was God's first thought from the beginning, in a certain sense, to create a setting and a place for Shabbat to reside and to be fulfilled. Again, a concept. Now, what does it mean that God saw all that he had made and that it was good? What does it mean that it was it actually was very good? It was very good. So many, many perspectives possible. I think for the scientist, it's very good because it's predictable and it can be explored and theories can be developed and it could be conceptualized and understood. And hence we can say that if you want to get married five years from now on a Tuesday in March, we can tell you exactly what time and where you're gonna want, you want to get married we can tell you exactly what time the sun will go down so that you can get that perfect photograph of the chuppah and the chatan and kala standing under it just as the sun sets over the horizon. So that's what that's a good thing because it was unpredictable. We wouldn't be able to schedule things so far in advance and we wouldn't be able to understand why the sun is going down when it is. So Rabbi, I, I have a quick question about your favorite verse there. Okay. Why, when God beheld all that he had made, was it only very good? Why wasn't it perfect? After all, God made it. Okay, good question. Right. And, 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 um, and, and it's interesting because the word tov itself, that means good. Um, let me answer your question in one second. I want to just go through a couple of variations explaining this sentence first. And then we're going to look at that. Okay. So if you look at the note on the art scroll, which I happen to like very much, and it's based on the commentaries that are right here, the, the Rambam, Maimonides says it was good. And here he uses a um, Greek concept, in my, I, that I understand it. Everything was fit for its purpose and able to act accordingly. So, in other words, if this cup is good, this cup is good because I want to drink out of it. It holds a good amount of liquid. It doesn't leak. I'm able to drink out of it easily. It has a nice proportion of the top to the bottom. Uh, I can pick it up. It's not too big. It's not too heavy. So it's good. It's good because it, it is the proper 
container to fulfill its purpose to enable me to have a drink. And that's this idea of function and form. And when form and function match up, uh, for some reason, all the Greek philosophers did a dance and they were happy and they felt as though life was good. The Vilna Gon says, as the note says here, and I looked up these sources a little bit, that it says God saw all that he had made and it was very good. So here's the, here's the rub that the Vilna Gon, the nuance he picks out of this sentence. I have 10 things, they're all good. I like my baseball glove and I like my baseball hat and I like my baseball jersey. Okay, but now when I put them all together and I look at them and I say, oh, now I'm ready to play ball. If only they can settle the contract dispute and I can make my $20 million this season, everything will be good in the world. So the idea being that God contemplated the scope of what was created. So each and every object was perfectly formed for what it was meant to contribute to the total. And then the total was greater than the sum of its parts, so to speak. And that's that idea of kol asher asa. God saw the totality of everything that was created. And it was not just tov, because everything was created tov, but now it was tov ma'od. The Torah is not going to use the word idea of perfect, and we'll, we'll, that's a, the Torah does talk about God being perfect and us being perfect with Hashem, the word tamim, but we'll save that discussion for another time. But that's another implication. And then Rav Hirsch, the, the next component here, says something very interesting. He says that a person can only appreciate goodness in the world when a person when a person sees things with scope. And scope is a big idea for me. It's a very basic, fundamental, important idea. The greater scope a person has, now let's do it this way. A definition of truth is a statement that takes everything into account. And I use the example that Tzipora Heller used. If someone asked me, please describe Adolf Hitler, which is not a remote thing for us to think about now, given what's going on in the Ukraine. And I say, Adolf Hitler, he was a vegetarian. Now, for many people, oh, he must have been gentle, kind, considerate, walking lightly in the world, concerned about the ecology, wanting everything to thrive. Okay, that statement in itself is true, but it lacks scope because it's focusing on, it's narrowing its focus to one specific aspect, which could even be irrelevant in its importance. And therefore, if you, you need to look at a bigger picture, if you want to come to grips with who that person is. And hence, Refersh introduces the idea in this sentence that even suffering and even pain has value and importance provided a person broadens their scope and gives it consideration in the context of what we would call history and the context of ramifications for all of humanity and in the broadest sense of the word, in the, in the broadest sense of vision that a person can have. And we know ultimately only God can have total vision. You know, and that's the conversation God had with Moshe last week. God said, Moshe says, show me your face. I want to comprehend God. I want to understand you. I want to understand your ways. God, Moshe says to God, and God answers, you can't do that. Human beings don't have that capacity. They lack that capacity. That's a godly capacity. And we see it applied, for example, on the Yom Kippur prayer, when we're talking about the death of the 10 martyrs, and the angels themselves call out to God and say, how could this be happening to these people? And God says, be quiet, <clears throat> because if you consider, keep asking this question, I will have to unravel all of creation, which is understood. I will have to take existence apart piece by piece into its components and show them to you so you can begin to see the scope of things and how every incident, every moment, and every item fits together with all others. So this explains the Tov Mode, I think, you know, um, Frank, in, in a good way. 
everything is tov. And when we get together, it's tov ma'od, because not only is there syner- symmetry between form and function, but the symmetry in totality of the way the entire universe fits together. And an example of that, you know, is the great um, discovery in physics that every body in the world, every every atom exerts an influence on every other atom. I think that's true. So in other words, we're all in this together. So that if Pluto decides to move a couple of millimeters out of its orbit, it's going to make the whole our whole solar system go kapooey because it'll unbalance all of the pushes and pulls that are going on throughout. But I want to introduce another idea to this idea of tov mode. It's a different concept. And that's this. We know the Midrash says right after this that God comes to Adam and says, look at my universe, look at my multiverse, look at all of my creation, look how beautiful it is. Take care not to ruin it. Now, God wasn't saying to Adam, don't develop a nuclear weapon which could explode and contaminate the world and end life as we know it. Rather, God was saying that there's a moral component and there's a spiritual component to every blade of grass and to this universe I've created. And that balance is placed in the hands of human beings. So it, it, in a way, it's, a, it's an amazing statement. God, God says, I see everything and everything is tov ma'od. It fits together. It's in harmony and it, it's beautiful and it works and it works. It's, it's beautiful individually and it's beautiful in totality. Okay. And then, you know, we advance 130,000 troops to the border of another country ready to wreak havoc and kill people and conquer. And then the world doesn't look like such a beautiful place anymore. And, and it's hard for us to say, wow, this is beautiful. And that's what God was telling Adam. So, so we see this idea here. It's a very, very important idea that we human beings are entrusted with the goodness of everything. And we can uplift it and we can strengthen it and we can build upon it or we can ruin it. Just as this idea of Shabbos being sof ma'aseh b'machashova t'chira, that Shabbos is introduced to the world at the end because Shabbos can supercharge the spirituality and the value and the import of all of existence. And that's why it's the first concept that God has. It elevates everything. It comes at the end because it's left to us to fulfill that aspect of the creation with our own free choice. Sam, did you have a question? I'm not sure. (laughs) I do. Um, And I'm not sure if it fits in properly, but in our scope of life. So is there a difference between us having a scope of all is well versus this sentence that um, everything is very good? Okay, but I think, right, I, I think that what Hirsch is saying is that part of trusting in God, part of reading the story of creation from the book of Genesis, which really goes on to say that God prepared prepared a Gan Eden, a perfect garden for human beings to live in, and he placed Adam and Eve into it, and he gave them an opportunity to live in total peace and harmony there, and then again it was disrupted, and he had to throw them out, and we had to go into a world which cooperates less with us and challenges us and gives us a harder time on every level, shape, and form. But the challenge is still the same. The challenge is to open our eyes to the viewpoint that this is our opportunity to take a good world and a good existence and to add value to that existence. So God conceived of creation. God 
created. God places Adam and Eve into an ideal situation in creation. We live in a less than ideal situation within that creation, but we still have that same opportunity to, to fulfill its goodness or to destroy its goodness. And that's what freedom of choice is all about. And you see, so it's the idea of taking the potentiality of something and, and bringing it to life and bringing it into the world. Does that answer your question a little bit? It does, thank you. Okay. So let's go on in this with this concept a little bit further. Um, I want to introduce something else with this idea of conceiving of something and then bringing it to reality. And again, it's on a spiritual level. But if we turn to page 100 in the art scroll, Stone Chumash, we find ourselves in an interesting place. And hopefully it's the place that I'm thinking of. <laughs> yes, okay, good. So we're here, as it says on page 101 in the art scroll, the 10th trial, the Akedah, chapter 22, sentence one. And it happened after these things that God tested Avraham. Be'elokim nisa et Avraham. Now, I've given many tests in my life to kids that I've taught them something. And what do I want to do? I got 20 kids in front of me. I spent the last three days explaining to them the magnificence of this concept of taking a, a thought, a good thought, and making it happen in the world, taking an item and elevating it. And now I want to know, did you understand what I'm talking about? So I hand out a test and I bring them home late at night as some teachers tend to do. And I sit down to grade it and I say, oh my goodness, where, where did this kid get this idea from? I can't believe you wrote that answer. And it's, it's a wonderment to me. And then another kid, wow, I didn't realize this kid really understood that idea. He asked me some questions and seemed to be a, he or she understood it so well, but I see beautiful work here. God doesn't have to do that. God interacts with all of us in a total way. God knows what's in our hearts. He knows what's in our thoughts. So what does it mean that God tested? So you get various nuances of viewpoint, but you get significantly the Ramban, Nachmanides, arguing with Maimonides on a nuance, but saying clearly that the goal of a test, God knows what's in your heart. God knows the extent to which Abraham feared God as going to be the outcome of this particular test. So what is God doing? Playing around with him, as some of the classical commentaries say, does God just want to put him through a little suffering? And the answer is, that God wants Abraham to take that latent feeling of awe and fear and reverence for God, and he wants Abraham to actualize it. God wants it to go from potential abiding within Abraham to an expressed act, action taking place, which then brings it from its potential, from its concept, into the world as a thing, as a something, as an act of unbelievable subservience to God, reverence, awe. We can't really understand it because it involves taking the life of his precious son. So we don't wrap our heads around the whole concept very well. But we would know if we wanted to simplify it, you know, when we have a baby and we bring them to the, we have a higher mall to give the child a circumcision, you know, and then we're standing there and we see that sharp blade come out of the mall's little case there. And we think, well, this is my kid here, you know, and, and there's, he's going to be bleeding. And why am I doing this? So again, we're, we're actualizing a certain sense that, yeah, I want my kid to be devoted and dedicated to higher purposes. I just don't want him to be a being who eats and drinks and poops and lives out his life. So this is the this is the manner in which God gives us an opportunity to elevate the future life of our child. It's um, harsh, it's brutal, it's bloody, but I'm ready to do that. I don't think I'd be ready to do what Abraham was ready to do, but on my own level, 
in my own context, um, and also in order to have a good bagels and lox breakfast, I'm all in. So we do it. So what are we doing? We're taking a sense of latent potential, theoretical reverence for God and an interest in drawing close to God and an interest in elevating God's creation. In this case, it's my child. And we're taking action to do so. So something goes from theory into practice. And that's what performing mitzvot is all about. And that's why I can't just sit back and say, yeah, God, I'm all yours. You've got me hook, line, and sinker. And um, just um, give me a break. I want to um, eat what I feel like eating right now. I know you have all these kosher laws, and they're really a pain in the neck. And um, just look the other way. Let me gobble down my sandwich, and then we can go back to communing with each other. That's why we don't do that, because, it, it, because we want to see efforts to draw close and to and we want to see the actualization and the expression of a relationship come to light in the world and that's this word of oseh that's the word of doing you know a, a simple thing oseh shalom bim ramav hu yaaseh shalom oleinu god makes peace up in the heavens and we hope that he will make peace amongst us. That's quite an achievement. It requires a lot of actualization of love and commitment and kindness and a lot of not actualizing feelings like vengeance and hatred and arrogance and wanting everything to be centered around me. So hence we get this concept again of making something, creating something. And the next time we see this, is we see this in Shemot, it's on page 412 in our stone Chumash. And we see it in an interesting way, it's using the same terminology as we saw in Genesis 20. But if you look on, on chapter Shemot in Exodus chapter 20, sentence 17, which can be found on page 412, 413 in the Stone Chumash. We're talking here about the experience of standing at Mount Sinai. And the Torah says, Vayomer Moshe Elam, Moshe speaks to the people and tells them, do not fear, for in order to elevate you has God come. Now, it's interesting because the word in Hebrew is that same word, nasot, which could easily be translated and more literally be translated as to test you, God came. But we're going to stay with our context that God brought us to Sinai and spoke to us not to steal our souls out from within us, because that experience of encountering God is so overwhelming, but God did it to bring out from within us this connection to God, this potential connection to God, and to actualize it. And that's why our translation says, in order to elevate you, because Rashi says that by actualizing the experience of we, the Jewish people, hearing God speak to us, we become elevated. And it actually is the same word as true ma, Rome, to be lifted up, that we're going to see used over and over again when it comes to building the Mishkan, that we've seen it already. And what we're going to see when it comes to any gift, true ma, any gift to elevate something and to support a spiritual endeavor. So what Moshe is telling us here is that our experience at Sinai, being there, hearing it, seeing it, experiencing it, God actually entering the universe, so to speak, and communicating directly with us, that was an actualization of our relationship with God, which elevates us and raises us up and tests us in the sense of taking the potential within us to connect to God and making that into something real, something that happened, something that took place. Okay. And that's that's also using that word 
to, 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 to make something happen for something to actually take place. And now two more sources I wanna look at to really broaden this concept up a little bit more. And I'll be happy to make an attempt to answer questions. Let's look at the mitzvah of Shkolim itself, which we add on. We add on that Torah reading this Shabbat when we finish reading the Torah, instead of the Maftir repeating that section, the final few sentences of the Parsha, we instead turn to page 484, 485, chapter 30, sentence 11, and we read the section of Shkolim, which we really read last week. By the Be'er Hashem on Moshe Mor, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, when you take a census of the children of Israel, according to their numbers, every man shall give Hashem an atonement for his soul when counting them, so that there will not be a plague amongst them when counting them. This alludes to the idea that counting Jewish people is verboten, and we don't do that. So we have to have an alternative form of counting them. And of course, counting some anything gives it an individual importance, right? When the miser sits down at night with his opens up his bag of gold coins and he says, one, two, three, four. What he's doing is saying, ah, here is everything I want in the world. And I've got not only one gold coin and not only two gold coins and not only three gold coins. So each and every one adds to that pile and you count something because it gives you pleasure. And that's the way that God counts the Jewish people. Each and every individual person matters and counts. And then we see something unusual, really unusual. So it says in sentence 14, sentence 15, the wealthy shall not increase and the destitute shall not decrease from half a shekel to give the portion of Hashem to atone for our soul, to atone for our souls. So interesting, this is a very unusual fundraiser, but it's not a fundraiser. It's a very unusual accounting for people. Because if I come to the Moshe and I say, Moshe, look, I'm a very poor person. How about if I just give you a quarter of a shekel? So we can understand Moshe saying, look, if you have to beg, borrow, not steal, but work extra hard to come up with a half a shekel, that's the minimum. We understand minimums to count and to buy in. But why should there be a maximum? Why can't the wealthy person say, Moshe, this is so inspiring. God has blessed me so much. Uh, I, I am not the miser who wants to sit home and count my gold coins. I want to give you a gold coin that's worth 50 shekel. Let me do that. We say, no, you may not do that. Why would that be the case? Many answers are given, but what we're, to me, the common denominator amongst them is we want to push people in the sense that every single person has something to contribute to the world, and ultimately that something is of equal importance to what everyone else contributes. How is this played out? For example, in the Hasidic world, they talk about the idea that what to have shekel, you know, 50 cents, you know, buddy, can you spare a dime? You know, just I'm giving something, but I don't feel like I'm giving something. Okay, but you're giving something, you're elevating it, you're taking something from the world. And then they reflect and say, how often do I feel that my mitzvah or my choice or my restraint from taking revenge has any real significance to it. Oh, who am I? I'm just another guy. Uh, I, I'm happy to sit in the back. I'm not looking for history to revolve around me. I don't want my name to be the headline of every newspaper. I'm not a Putin. I don't need to see my name gracing the front page of every single newspaper in the world right now. That's not my thing. Okay. But don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think that therefore what you do doesn't have great import and significance in the elevation of all of creation. 
in actualizing a sum of your potential, you're fulfilling the world and fulfilling what God set out to accomplish. And so the old question that people used to ask when I was a kid, oh, you think God really cares whether I buy this candy bar with an OU or this candy bar without an OU? What is he, such a petty being? And the answer is, these are choices a person is making. And these choices have moral import. And yeah, it's just a bite. It's just a morsel. It's just a half shekel. But that too has intrinsic importance and intrinsic value. And then to combine this with a comment that Rashi makes here. Rashi makes the following comment. It says, Zayitnu, sentence 13. This shall you give. And Rashi follows a rule of his that whenever the word ze is there, ze in Hebrew, this means to point with your finger. So what is, and, and it's extraneous in this sentence. It could have just said, everyone who passes through the sentence gives a half a shekel. Why does it have to say, this shall you give? So it says that Rashi, that Rashi quotes a medrash here that says, when God told this mitzvah to Moshe, Moshe himself was skeptical. He thought to himself, a half shekel, come on. You know, it's going to be harder to count a couple of hundred thousand half shekels. Let's just make it a shekel already. It'll be so much easier. And God said, this is the half shekel. And what he showed them in the shekel was that beyond, Rashi quotes the Medrash, it says it was a shekel on fire. It was a half shekel burning and surrounded in flame. And again, the more mystical sources explain that you're right, a half shekel is just a half shekel. If it falls out of your pocket and you're busy, you don't even bother going back and picking it up perhaps. But when you give it, whatever spiritual import you invest into that half shekel, and that's the fire surrounding it, your intent, your interest, and being counted in amongst the Jewish people. Your interest in making a positive contribution to the good of the world, and your understanding that my even my smallest contribution elevates the world based on the intensity and the clarity and the depth of feeling I put into it. That's what the Zen, this shall you give. Don't ever underestimate, devalue, in any way denigrate every ounce of actualization of good intentions, of devotion, of kindness, of all the positive things in the world. And don't ever pretend that a small measure of hatred or a small measure of callousness or a small measure of revenge doesn't in and of itself wreak havoc in the world and disrupt this goodness that God has built into creation. Don't overlook that. And that's where the Machzi Tzashekel comes in to open our eyes on so many levels. And I want to introduce one final idea to this idea of actualization. And it's an amazing idea. I saw this medrash quoted by Rav Lopiansky in a recent article he wrote. And the Midrash says something that's very strange. There's, first of all, there's a Gemara in, there's a Gemara in Kedushin, page 40b. And in it, they, there's a dispute that takes place. All the rabbis meet and they're having a discussion. And the question comes up, what's more important, the study of Torah or the performance of mitzvot? What's more important? So Rabbi Tarfon says the performance of the mitzvah is more important. So he's like, he's heard my class and he knows, yeah, actualize it. You know, don't read about it, do it. So let's not study the building of the Mishkan. Let's get together and put the thing, let's, let's make it. That's what he says. Rabbi Akiva speaks up and says, nope, it's the study that's more important. Talmud Gadol, study is more important. And then all the rabbis together respond to this dispute, and they very famously say 
the study of Torah is more important because the study of Torah brings one to the performance of mitzvot. Ultimately, through the study of Torah, a person achieves both. And what we could say here in the context of this class, and this is a, an explanation to this, that the study of Torah rejuvenates and expands my potential for goodness so that then my actions take on a bigger dimension and I'm able to do more and of course, doing more does have a bigger impact on the world. I'm able to undertake more. I'm able to, even though I'm not allowed to give more than a half a shekel when it comes to the counting, but I'm able here to contribute more mightily to the good of the world. Okay, a nice idea. Here's a shocker. The Midrash says the following. The Midrash says, I want to quote exactly, and I did write it out here. Medrash, not in this Gemara, but in a different discussion, says, Rabbi Eliez, Elozer, Rabbi Abba, Bishem, Rabbi Acha, Omer. So in the name of Rabbi Acha, they say, Lomad, if someone learns Torah, the lowly made, and he didn't ever teach that Torah to someone else, Ein Lucha Hevel Gadol Mizet, and by Yikra Rabba, Chapter 22, number two, saying the following. And this requires a little bit of thought. And I think this will expand the concept that we've been talking about until now. I learned something. So we already know from the Gemara in Kedushin that my learning is important in and of itself because it will increase my capacity and my understanding and my potential to do in the world. It's the engine, it's the fire in the engine that keeps it going so that actions can take place and so that can, potential can be actualized. But let's look at learning itself. This Medrash introduces an idea which is mind blowing and it's the following, that a fulfillment of learning itself is teaching it to someone else. And hence, if someone learns Torah and that Torah just rests within that person, and it's never shared, it's never taught, it's never magnified in the world, then it's utterly futility of futility. It's hevel havoim. It's what the book of Ecclesiastes covers, just air that dissipates and has no ultimate value, breath that carries no import. So we see here another idea of what actualizing potential is all about. Even in our learning itself, our learning builds potential, our learning magnifies capacity, and then our taking those ideas and teaching them to other people is in itself an actualization of my learning. Of course, if, let's say if we're studying about a mitzvah like tzitzis, and then I put my tzitzis on, great. If we're studying about Shabbos, and then I observe Shabbos, great, we've actualized the learning and we brought it into the world. But teaching it itself, conveying it to another person, sharing inspiration, adding potential to someone else alongside yourself, that's imperative as a part of learning Torah. And if a person does not do that, then that person is, expend, is taking potential and just letting it slip away into nothing. And that's what the Medrash says. So there is a lot to think about here. I mean, the concept I, I sort of thought about at the end of this class is, you know, when you see a couple who have the potential to bring life into the world and they say, oh, life is beautiful, life is beautiful, but we're not having children, choosing not to have children, whatever, I'm not trying to castigate any person. So what are they saying? They're saying, I like the idea, I'm proud of the potential that's within us, but I'm not willing to undertake the actualization of that potential. And so we have a Parsha in the Torah devoted to actualizing and creating in the world 
and even in a less than perfect way, because we all agree if God Almighty would have made the Mishkan, it would have been made more perfectly. If Moshe himself had made it all himself, it could have been made more, per more close to something perfect. Um, but that's not what's meant to be. What's meant to be is for us to take all the potential and all the concepts of, that God has introduced into the world and all the creation that God has made and for us to add value to it, express potential into action and into reality and to share with one another the inspiration to do so. And that's what it means for a person to actualize and fulfill the life that they've been given. Happy to take any questions. Happy to, um, the hour is late and I just wanna wish everybody a good evening. And I thank you very much for joining. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.